Clyde Barrow was born on the 24th of March, 1909, the sixth of eight neglected children in Teleco, Texas, a small town near Dallas. His hero was the outlaw, Jesse James, and he rarely went to school. His parents were too busy scraping a living on their farm to look after their children. At nine, Clyde was consigned to an institution for delinquents as an incorrigible truant, thief and runaway. Teleco was in the Dust Bowl, a vast area of the southwestern states devastated by drought and overcropping during the 1930s. Two-thirds of the population migrated, among them Clyde's father, who sold the farm for what he could get and started a garage. Clyde wanted to provide for his mother, but his only skills were outside the law. And in 1929, he and his brother Ivan, known as Buck, were shot at by police while driving a stolen car. Buck was arrested and got five years in jail for a long list of offences. Clyde managed to get away. A few weeks later, at a girlfriend's house, he met Bonnie Parker. Soon she took him home to meet Mother. She was 19, slim and tiny, funny and clever. She delighted him. Bonnie had been born at Rowena, Texas, a year after Clyde. Her father died when she was four, and she and her mother went to live with her grandmother in a rough section of Dallas called Cement City. Bonnie and her sister Billy escaped into marriage as soon as they could, both of them to petty crooks. In this prison photograph, Bonnie's husband, Roy Thornton, stands on the left next to her sister's husband, Bud. Within a year of their wedding, Roy had left, and Bonnie had got a job in this Dallas cafe. The morning after Clyde moved in with her, the police came looking for him. He got two years in jail for car theft, with 12 more years suspended. His brother Buck was already inside, and both were scheming to break out. Buck managed it in March 1930, when he got over the wall of Huntsville Penitentiary. He married a Dallas girl named Blanche, who didn't know who he was, while on the run. When she found out he was an escaped prisoner, she persuaded him to give himself up. But Clyde's girl, Bonnie, taped this slim-handled coat to her body and slipped it to Clyde through the bars. That night he used it to escape from Waco jail, but he was recaptured in Middletown, Ohio the next week after bungling a burglary. Now faced with his full 14 years, he engineered his release by asking a fellow inmate to chop off two of his toes. In prison, he had been educated by hardened criminals, and now Clyde emerged into a world of widespread lawlessness. For crime and gangsterism had been encouraged by prohibition. The cities were ruled by the mob and the run-down rural areas were the hunting grounds of such outlaws as John Dillinger. The depression that had followed the Wall Street crash had America in its grip. Three and a half million families were forced on relief and jobs for untrained men just out of jail didn't exist. Many people regarded those who turned to robbing banks as heroes, attacking the symbols of riches in the midst of degrading poverty. Clyde Barrow promised his mother that he would try to go straight, but he found it simply impossible. The loyal and lively Bonnie joined him in a crime spree across Texas, but at a robbery in Kaufman, Texas, they were separated. She was caught in jail for three months, but Clyde and friends kept robbing. In April 1932, he and former fellow prisoner Raymond Hamilton killed jeweler John Bucher, grabbing rings worth two and a half thousand dollars from his safe. From Booker's town of Hillsborough, Clyde and Hamilton roamed the Texas backwards, holding up gas stations until Bonnie could join them. Between robberies, they larked about, posing for snapshots. These added to their notoriety, giving the press the chance to portray them as ruthless lovers who roamed the countryside of Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas and Missouri, robbing and killing while remaining a romantic couple. The truth was more complicated. During his time in jail, Clyde had learned to be bisexual, and he and Bonnie shared their fellow gang member Ray Hamilton, who enjoyed sex any way he could get it. 
Throughout 1932, they cut a swathe through the South. Anyone who stood in their way was killed or kidnapped. They shot four people dead in that year alone. They stole cars and guns whenever they needed them. By Christmas, Ray Hamilton had been arrested on a trip home. They wanted a substitute, and while robbing a gas station, kidnapped 16-year-old William Daniel Jones and convinced him to replace Hamilton. WD, as he was known, was stealing a Ford V8 with Clyde when the owner jumped on the running board. Clyde casually shot him in the head and killed him. The next week, their hideout was surrounded, and in escaping, they killed a deputy sheriff. In March 1933, Buck Barrow was paroled, thanks to the tearful pleas of his wife, Blanche. Then she and Buck promptly joined up with Bonnie, Clyde and W.D. to form the new Barrow Gang. First, they needed some more guns, which Clyde got by raiding the Federal Armory in Springfield, Missouri. They celebrated by holding up a loan company in Kansas City. While the police searched vainly for them over six states, they were nipping back to Dallas to visit their families. After robbing a jewelry store in Neosho, Missouri, they rented a house nearby, but a neighbor spotted them carrying guns. They had to leave these behind when the house was raided. They also left two dead lawmen. That night, they drove 400 miles from Neosho to get into Texas. Clyde had caught a bullet in the arm. Bonnie prized it out with a hairpin. For all their fame, the sums they stole were tiny. The most they ever got was $2,500 in May 1933 from the first state bank in Okabina, Minnesota. John Dillinger commented, couple of punks, they're giving bank robbing a bad name. A few days later, Clyde was driving at his usual speed when he crashed the car on a bend in flames. Bonnie was badly burned. When Clyde was reluctant to call the doctor, the family that had taken them in phoned the police. Two officers arrived, but were ambushed and taken hostage. The Barrows stole their cars and kidnapped them. But once the gang was safely across the state line, they were released. Bonnie slowly recovered, but the gang was forced to keep on the move through Kansas, Iowa, northern Texas, and Missouri. Then on the 19th of July, they narrowly escaped a police ambush near Platte City, Iowa, in which Buck was shot and wounded in the head. On they went, but less than a week later, they were spotted at a campsite near the town of Dexter. The police surrounded the campsite, but Bonnie was up early. As shots rang out, she, Clyde, and W.D. got away by swimming across a river where they hijacked a car. But Buck was hit in the back. When the lawmen reached the couple, Blanche was bent over him. As this photograph taken minutes later shows, they pulled her away. Buck hung on for five more days, but Blanche, regarded as a dangerous criminal, was not allowed to spend any time with him. He died calling for her, but she was locked in a cell and was later sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. Now W.D. Jones fled and was arrested in Houston. He claimed he had been forced to take part, but he still got 15 years in jail. Over the next four months, Bonnie and Clyde killed four more lawmen as they continued to evade capture. In November, they arranged to meet their families near Dallas. The sheriff there heard of the rendezvous and got ready to ambush them. As they drove up, he sportingly gave them the chance to surrender but they quickly sped off amid gunfire. Enraged at losing them, Sheriff Schmid gave three of his deputies orders to bring them back dead or alive. Ed Castor, Ted Hinton, who knew Bonnie when she was a waitress, and Bob Alcorn were told to go after the couple full time. But the outlawed pair were defiant. Early one January morning, they crept up on a work gang at Eastern Prison Farm and set five convicts free. In the operation, a guard was killed. Now they had a new team, including their old accomplice and lover, Ray Hamilton. Another convict insisted on staying with them until he was paid money Hamilton owed him. After they robbed a bank, he allowed himself to be recaptured. 
But another new recruit, Henry Methvin, appeared loyal to Clyde. There was a lot of sexual tension, as Ray had introduced his new girlfriend, Mary O'Dare, into the gang, and she made a play for Methvin. The new gang held up gas stations and stores as they went, as well as stealing larger sums from banks, including a hall in the town of Lancaster. While the press continued to give the gang sensational coverage, there was a bitter row going on over the division of the spoils. Clyde accused Ray of secretly pocketing some of the proceeds, so Hamilton and his girl quit. But now Clyde worried that Hamilton would betray him, and he decided to follow and rub him out before he did. While the gang was breaking up, a new hunter had joined the trail. This ex-Texas ranger, Frank Hamer, paid by the governor of Huntsville Prison to get Clyde. But then came the incident which changed public perception of the outlaws. This is a reconstruction made shortly afterwards. Bonnie and Clyde were boldly keeping a rendezvous with some of their henchmen near Grapevine, Texas. While they waited, they drank whiskey, made love to each other, and practiced their marksmen by shooting at birds. Presently, two state highway patrol officers sighted the pair. They decide to investigate. They approach Bonnie and Clyde, totally unaware of their identity. In reality, the gang had been waiting to intercept and murder Raymond Hamilton. It was Henry Methvin, not shown in the film, who started firing on the cops. Only then did Bonnie and Clyde join in. This atrocious murder sealed the doom of Bonnie and Clyde. Every... The cold-bloodedness of this killing turned public opinion against the couple, regardless of the fact that it was Methvin who had begun the shooting. Rewards for the capture of the Barrow Gang were now being offered, and the public increased its vigilance. In April 1934, Ray Hamilton was arrested for robbery and got 362 years in jail. After a second trial for the murder of the guard, he ended up in the electric chair. Now the lawmen on Bonnie and Clyde's trail joined forces, determined to catch the whole gang. Led by Frank Hamer, seen here in the dark hat, who had killed 60 outlaws as a ranger, they included Hamer's deputy, Manny Galt, Ted Hinton and Bob Alcorn from Dallas. Together, they were a formidable team. With Hamilton taken care of for him, Clyde led his little band northeast into Oklahoma. Never far behind now, their pursuers actually saw them in Duvant, Oklahoma on the 4th of April, but hesitated to open fire for fear of killing passers-by. Near Commerce in Oklahoma, two policemen flagged down a car with a bullet hole in its windscreen. Constable Cal Campbell was hit and killed by machine gun fire as they approached the car. Percy Boyd, Commerce's chief of police, received a slight head wound and was taken prisoner. The gang held on to him for 24 hours, but liked him enough to let him go eventually. He reported that Clyde was cocky and vain, and that Henry Methvin was very much in his shadow. But he really liked Bonnie, and said she was nothing like this picture. She was annoyed by the headline, Clyde Barrow's Cigar Smoking Moll, and regretted posing. He reported that in real life she was much more like this picture and that she and Clyde seemed genuinely in love. In the car with them she had a pet rabbit named Sonny Boy, which was intended as a present for her mother. With this clue, the tracking party headed south, making for Dallas, where the couple were meeting up with Clyde's parents and Bonnie's mother on a country road and browsing through recent snapshots. Bonnie's mother later remembered Bonnie quietly saying, when they kill us, don't ever say anything ugly about Clyde. Bidding what was to turn out to be their last farewell to their folks, Bonnie and Clyde headed eastwards, while their pursuers turned the screw with another warrant for murder.
desperately tired themselves, the rangers hoped that their quarries would make a fatal mistake out of sheer fatigue. When their car was spotted parked outside a cafe at Shreveport, Louisiana, Hinton guessed they intended to rendezvous with Henry Method at his father's nearby farm. So, while every local robbery was ascribed, mostly wrongly, to Bonnie and Clyde, the six rangers staked out the Methvin farm near Shreveport. When Hinton spied them driving down the road from Arcadia, he knew he was right. Rather than risk an abortive chase, he and his fellow rangers now settled down to wait for their prey. Their cars now carried this massive armory of automatic weapons, but little to make their ambush a comfortable one. This reconstruction of what happened next was made only a few days later and presents a somewhat idealized picture of what was actually a miserable, wet and mosquito-bitten wait for the six lawmen. For three days and nights, these officers lay in wait on this road, but Bonnie and Clyde were wary. While hiding in the undergrowth on the 23rd of May at 4 a.m., the officers had stopped Henry Methvin's father as he drove up the road. They handcuffed him to a tree and left his truck by the side of the road as a decoy. But on this morning, this sixth sense did not serve to warn him of their presence. Then, just after 9.15, a tan Ford was seen approaching. It looks like the car, fellas. Hinton recognized Clyde, who was driving. That's him, for sure. I'll guarantee you. Get ready now. As Clyde saw the Methvin truck, he slowed down. And as he did so, the ambushers opened fire. That's him, fellas. If he reaches for it, let him have it. Look down. Riddled with bullets, the car stopped. This film is not a reconstruction, but was taken a few minutes after the shooting. Here is Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker who died as they lived, by the gun. Bonnie is seen leaning against Clyde. Clyde was a master gunman. Seldom did anyone ever live when Clyde got the first shot. There were a pistol and shotgun ready on the floor of the car next to Bonnie, but the ambush took her by surprise. Within hours, the ambush site was filling with sightseers. And a procession of more than 50 cars escorted a shattered Ford as it was towed into the police pound in Arcadia to be put on show. The fence was needed because ghoulish souvenir hunters had already tried to rip parts off the car and seize bits of Bonnie and Clyde's clothing and hair before they were removed from it. back seat the lawman found three light machine guns, two shotguns, a dozen pistols and at least a thousand rounds of ammunition. But the couple had had no chance to fire any of these before the six lawmen had loosed 107 rounds into the car in less than two minutes. Their bodies had been riddled with about 50 bullets each. The men who had hunted down the murderous couple became national heroes. Twenty relatives and friends stood trial for harboring the couple during their period as outlaws. While the men were chained together to prevent any attempt at overpowering their guards, the women, despite Bonnie's example, were not regarded as dangerous. W.D. Jones, serving 15 years, and Henry Methvin, life, each got an extra two years. Among the women, Mary O'Dare, Bonnie's sister Billy, and Buck's wife Blanche were sentenced to a year and a day in prison. Both mothers were on trial, and their lawyer pleaded that mother love took precedence over the law. However, the judge was not impressed by this defense or by Mrs. Barrow's infirmity, and gave them both 30 days. Clyde was buried next to his brother Buck at West Dallas Cemetery an aeroplane dropped a huge floral wreath. Despite her wish to be buried next to Clyde, Bonnie was taken to be buried at Dallas's Fish Trap Cemetery. While on the run, she had sent poems to various newspapers. 
they included her own prophetic epitaph. They don't think they're too tough or desperate. They know that the law always wins. They've been shot at before, but they do not ignore that death is the wages of sin. Someday they'll go down together, and they'll bury them side by side. To few it'll be grief, to the law a relief, but it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. But the emotions of their families, the legends which later grew up around the couple, and the awful inappropriateness of the epitaph on Bonnie's grave. As the flowers are all made sweeter by the sunshine and the dew, so this old world is made brighter by the lives of folks like you, could not disguise the fact that these were two of America's most cold-blooded and callous killers. The series is back all next week from Monday to Friday at noon. After the break, the perplexing story of the American nuclear submarine Scorpion, which vanished in the Sargasso Sea in 1968. Although the authorities insisted it was an accident, subsequent revelations hint at a darker scenario.